record. All right, so as usual, uh, please check out the textbook. There's a lot of good stuff in there. They have great examples. Um, I'll do some similar stuff, but not exactly the same. Um, thank you for submitting your homework stuff. I mean, your exam stuff. I'll start reviewing those after class today. So hopefully by tonight, I'll be done grading those. And so you'll find feedback and then sample answers from me in, the, in that section. All right. New topic, chapter four, are applications of derivatives, which we've already done a little bit as we've been going along. Now we've accumulated a ton of different rules about how to come up with a derivative function based on a starting function so that we don't have to use the definition, the limit definition, which is quite, quite cumbersome. So we've accumulated all these shortcut rules and I hope that you've created yourself a glossary, a one or two page document that lists all those shortcuts. So that's a really good idea if you haven't already done that. And so now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take all those tricks we've learned about how to come up with a derivative and we're going to uh, apply them to different situations. And so the first situation, section 4.1, is what's called related rates. And related rates are a combination of rates of change, which we've already looked at. So just watching something in, in our reality change uh, and the chain rule. Oh shit, I'm not sharing my screen, damn it. <laughs> but I recorded all that, thank you. All right. Beginning again, <laughs> chapter four, applications, related rates, rates of change, chain rule. Here we go. And so just a kind of a simple example uh, we could start with here is uh, just imagine we have this uh, balloon that we need to blow up and let's pretend the balloon is a perfect sphere. And we're gonna blow the balloon up and let's say we're gonna use an air compressor to do it. So we have a steady flow of air into the balloon and that we're, we're increasing, uh, we're blowing the balloon say at a rate of uh, 100 cubic centimeters per minute. All right, so that's the rate. volume change. So from our air compressor, we're blowing in 100 cubic centimeters per minute into our balloon. Let's pull a valve down here on the bottom to blow it up at. Now, as we blow it up, right, the volume is getting bigger, but the radius here is expanding. And so what we want to look at is, is how is the rate of change of the volume, right? So that would be dv dt. How is that related to the rate of change of the radius over time? Are they gonna be the same? Are they gonna be different? And to figure that out, we need to find a link between the things that are changing. And so the things that are changing here are the volume and the radius. And fortunately, we know a formula for the volume of a sphere. Volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. So at any point, if we know the volume, we can find the radius, or if we know the radius, we can find the volume. Now, because we know some calculus, we can use implicit differentiation to differentiate this with respect to time, and we can find the connection between the rate of change of the volume and the rate of change of the radius. Okay, so in addition to the chain rule, I guess I should have put up here that we also need implicit differentiation. Uh, and then, most problems are gonna involve some geometry. So then differentiating both sides of this, so I wanna differentiate the left side with respect to T. I wanna differentiate the right side with respect to T and just plop our things back in there. 
Now we got to pay attention to our variable that we're differentiating with respect to because it may not match the variables in our equation. So for example, uh, this is the derivative of V with respect to T. We could call that V dot or V prime. I'm just gonna call it DV dt. So I'm just gonna rewrite it like that. On the other side, I have this product going on, but four thirds is a constant, right? So that just pops out. Pi is just a constant, so that pops out. And then I just have to think about the derivative of R cubed and that's just the power rule, that's three R squared. However, I'm differentiating with respect to time. R is changing over time. So the chain rule says you got to multiply by the derivative of the inner function R. And the derivative of R is just dr dt. So now I have this relationship between the change in volume and the change in radius based on the relationship between volume and radius. And we can clean that up a little bit, right? So dv dt is equal to, let's see, the threes divide out. So four pi r squared dr dt. Now, something else to, to think about is uh, over time here, the volume is changing, right? And the radius is changing also. So at any instant in time that we pick, we should be able to find not only the time, but what's the volume and what's the radius there. So in order to figure out how the radius is changing, I need to know what the radius is at that instant. Uh, so right now, notice that I have this formula that relates dv dt and dr dt. Assuming that dv dt is a constant rate, so that's my dv dt up here, change in volume over change in time, I'm assuming that's constant. Does it have to be? Nope. But for most of the problems we have, we're gonna, we're gonna pick a constant rate, at least for an instant, if not for the duration of the problem. So then over here, I can just say, okay, so that's just dv dt is 100 equals four pi r squared the RDT, and if I'm interested you know, in, in the rate of change of the radius, I wanna solve for that. So then I would divide by the four pi R squared. So I'm just gonna switch sides here on things, move over here maybe. So dr dt is equal to 100 over four, four pi R squared. And, and we can see here that for different radii, different instances in time for this situation, the rate of change of the radius is gonna depend on how, how much volume is in the balloon uh, at, at any particular time uh, for the radius there. So if we look when say the radius is four centimeters, then we can nail down the rate of change of the radius. So dr dt in that case would just be 100. And I guess we could reduce the four over 100 over four. So let's do that. So then four goes into 100. So we have 25 over pi times the radius squared. So four squared down there. So we get 25 pi over 25, 16 pi in the bottom. And then we can whip that out on the calculator. Uh, double check that the units match here. So let's see, what do we know here? We know for the units, and again, if you have a good equation to start with, they should work out. We know that the units of the 100, those were centimeters cubed per minute. R we're measuring in centimeters and then we're squaring it. So in the denominator, we have centimeters squared and the four pi, that's just a constant related to the circle or the, the sphere. So that doesn't have units. If we take centimeters cubed divided by centimeters squared, we get centimeters and then we still have the per minute. So the units here are centimeters per minute, which makes sense because I'm looking at a change in the radius over a change in time. So those, those seem like appropriate units for this situation. And I guess should, I should say minute instead of M, which could be confused with meters.
So the rate of change, let's calculate that number just for fun. Desmos may be helpful today. So we've got 25 over pi times 16. And so we get about uh, 0.5 roughly centimeters per minute change in the radius. Now, we also have this general formula here. So I just want to look at that for a second, where given the rate of change of the volume here, right? That's my dv dt in the numerator. And given a specific radius, and the radius is increasing over time, right? Because we're pumping air into this balloon. So as the volume increases over here, the radius is forced to increase too, because they're related from that original equation. So let's just take a look at this equation right here, uh, the reduced version, 25 over pi r squared. So let's just call it, what are we gonna call this? Um, how about, can, it, can I do a double letter function name, dr of x equals 25 over pi x squared. Um, I don't think it likes that. So I guess we're just gonna have to call it D for derivative. There we go. Okay, so it doesn't like double letter names, uh, but this is our function right here. And the negative part isn't relevant to us, only the positive part here. <clears throat> so we can see that the bigger the radius gets, the slower it's changing. So this is again, the rate of change of uh, the radius for any particular radius. So the x-axis here is the radius. So maybe I should do a screenshot of this to scribble on it to be clear what I'm talking about. Oop, why didn't that work? Oh, I didn't hit the other button. There we go. All right, so here's my function. And so what am I looking at a graph of here? The uh, x-axis here is really r the radius and the y-axis here is the rate of change of the radius, dr dt. And remember that the volume change dv dt is constant. Oops, wrong order. At 100 cubic centimeters per minute. So we're, we're pumping in the same amount of volume at every minute, every second. And if the balloon is small in volume, right? If the radius is small over here, that volume is perceived as a larger change in the radius. So it looks like the radius is growing faster. And then later on, when the balloon's already really big, like over here, we have a much bigger radius we still have that same amount of volume being pumped in. So it's perceived as a smaller change in the radius over here. Another cool thing about this is we did this calculation for dv dt in our first step in the implicit differentiation. And we ended up with four pi r squared times dr dt. So my question right now, think about this for a second. Does this part right here, that multiple times dr dt, does that look familiar? to anybody. Anybody recognize that equation? Or excuse me, that expression, four pi r squared. Uh, it's not trig. It's close to the area of a circle, but go 3D with it. So uh, what it is, is the surface area of the sphere, which is kind of cool. So the rate of change of the volume is proportional to the rate of change of the radius. And that constant in proportionality 
is the surface area of the sphere. And think about it, that kind of makes sense. So I've got this sphere, All right? So here's my best picture of a sphere that we can see through. And then we make this sphere a little bit bigger. And so imagine making the sphere bigger by painting it, put a coat of paint around it. So if we put a coat of paint on this, we paint this sphere, right? So this is my coat of paint, <laughs> the best of my artistic ability here, right? The sphere is now a little bit bigger because the paint has a little bit of thickness. And then we put another coat of paint on and another coat of paint. And this right here is the coat of paint that's the surface area of the sphere. So think about it, right? As the volume increases and we're looking at a change in the volume here, the radius increases too. And it, and it turns out the relationship between the increase of the radius and the increase of the volume is the surface area. Small change in volume gives us a slightly bigger surface area. And that's what we're measuring here which I always thought was a wicked cool relationship. Um, let's see, I got a chat. Um, trig, is that not, so you mean that formula, the four pi r squared? Now pi r squared, right, that's, that's the area of a circle. So this is just the 3D version of that, which is just surface area, right? The paint on a sphere. So, I mean, I guess there's trig related to it because anything circular has trigonometry hiding in it, sines and cosines uh, in terms of like positions uh, on the sphere. Um, and if you get to like calculus three or calculus four, you'll get into that 3D geometry, trigonometry stuff. All right, let's look at a new problem. New page. Okay, this is a cute one. So kind of a little more trigonometry on this one. And I'm gonna grab some numbers from one of your homework problems. Question number three, I thought was cute. Blow that up and get a screenshot of that text. Just one sec. There we go. Now I can see my cursor. So at noon, we got the ship A, and it is 10 nautical miles due west of ship B. Ship A is sailing west at 23 knots, and ship B is sailing north at 23 knots. Okay, moving at the same speed. Um, how fast in knots is the distance between the ships changing at 6 p.m. and a knot is one nautical mile per hour. So we have a, a, our units match up okay because we have nautical miles here and a knot is a nautical mile per hour. So first thing we need to do in most of these related rates problems is, is make a sketch of what's going on. So let's see, A is northwest, uh, sorry, is due west of ship B. So let's see, west is that way. So if this is ship B right here, then A is over here. And then A is sailing in that direction. at 23 knots. And then B is sailing north. So B is moving this way and they are making a right triangle here. And we wanna know at uh, a time later when the ship A 
and B, let's say, is over there, what is the distance between them? How is that distance changing? So we have, uh, let's call this distance right here Y, and this distance right here X, and then the distance between them, we'll call that Z for fun. And we know a relationship between this distance Y, this distance X, and this distance Z, and Z is what we want. So we know, according to the Pythagorean theorem, Z squared equals X squared plus Y squared. Now X is the distance from here to here. And we're given some information that uh, X started out 10, uh, A started out 10 miles away from ship B and they're both moving uh, at 23 knots. So this distance X right here, we could say has an equation starting at 10, mi 10 nautical miles away. It is then increasing at 23 nautical miles per hour over T hours. So let's let T be hours, All right? So that's just a linear change in position for that one. Why? is starting at, let's call it zero here. So this could be like zero, zero. A started over here at 10, zero. And let's positive for A is in this direction. Positive for B is that direction. So Y is just 23 T. So then the relationship for Z at any particular time is just going to be the x squared. And this is how we calculate x at any particular time. So 10 plus 23t squared plus the y value squared. And at any particular time, that's the y value. So this is the relationship between z and x and y at any particular time. So if somebody says, OK, one hour later, how far apart are they? We just plug the one hour in here, plug the one hour in there, and then take the square root of the result, and we get z, the distance in between them. That makes sense? Just a little trigonometry there. All right, so what we want to know is not exactly the position, the distance z, but we want to know how z is changing. So this right here, we want to know how that distance is changing. That means they want to know what is dz dt when t is equal to six. So we started off at noon and then they want 6 p.m. So that would be just six hours later. So uh, then to do that, we just need to differentiate with respect to time. So that's our implicit differentiation. So in this case, we wanna know derivative with respect to time of this left side and compare that the derivative with respect to time of this right side over there. And in, in this case, I'm going to resist uh, taking squaring these things. I'm also going to resist taking a square root. I think it's going to be easier if we just try this. And we could have actually done that at this step here. And maybe I'll look at that one later just for fun, but I actually I don't think we need it. So remember, we're differentiating with respect to time. We're assuming that Z is a function of time, which it is. That distance is changing over time as the ships move away from each other. So uh, when I take the derivative here, derivative of that power is just two Z. And then the chain rule says multiply by the derivative of Z, which is just GZ dt. On the other side, I'm taking the derivative with respect to time and I've whittled it down to just time function. So uh, this one's not gonna be too bad. So the derivative of a square, so I have the chain rule going on here is two times whatever the base is and the base happens to be 10 plus 23t and then multiply by the derivative of the inside and the derivative of a linear function is just its slope 23. Plus over here, derivative of a square is two times the base, base is 23t, and then the derivative of 23t is 23. And then we can clean this up a little bit. 
let's see, we want dz dt at six. Uh, so we're gonna have to divide the z to the other side and clean this up a bit. So um, I can factor out the two times 23 because that's on each side of the plus. So I'm gonna get two times 23. And then I've got these two pieces added up. And so that's gonna give me 10 plus 46T. And then I wanna get dz dt alone. So I'm gonna divide by the 2z. And then things clean up a little bit because I have two divided by two here. So that's kind of nice. All right. So I'm just going to rewrite that over here. Let's put it in black. I now believe that dz dt, the rate of change of the distance between them over time, is equal to 23 times 10 plus 46t over z. Now, z is actually equal to the square root of all of this stuff. And that's fine. I mean, I could rewrite it in terms of t and get this expression to be just in terms of t by using that. <clears throat> so that would be an alternative. Uh, but bottom line here, I just want to know the number when I plug in 6. So 6 hours later. And so I can just calculate that uh, up there. So if we then take dz dt, and the notation for evaluating something like this is to put a vertical bar t equals six. So that means plug in the six. And I'm just going to get 23. And then it's pretty much calculator time at this point. There's no reason to do any more algebra. And then we want to evaluate that z is a function of t. So I guess we do need to throw that square root in there. And we'll have 10 plus 23 times 6 squared plus 23 times 6 squared. All right, so let's whip this out in a calculator and see what we get. Come on. My zoom screen is in the way. Down there, there we go. All right, so I don't really need that right now or anymore. So we've got our, right, 23, make a fraction, times 10 plus 46 times six, close parentheses over the square root, of 10 plus 23 times 6 squared plus 23 times 6 squared. I have all that in the right spot. I think that looks good. Double check the notes. Looks correct. Desmo says it's about 32 and a half uh, nautical miles per hour is the rate of change in between. Which are just called knots. Oops. And again, a knot is a nautical mile per hour, which is what we calculated dz dt. And let's think about that if that makes sense. So uh, go back up to my diagram here. So we have the rate of change in this direction right here. So that would be dy dt. 
that's just that 23 knots up there. And dx dt, the rate of change of this side over here, that's also 23 knots. And we just calculated that at least at this particular time, dz dt is about 32.5 uh, knots, nautical miles per hour. And in think about a, a right triangle, the hypotenuse is always longer so if these two are moving at a constant rate, since this side is longer, right, it should be changing a little bit faster to keep up with the other two. If it were just changing at the same rate, it wouldn't be able to keep up. It wouldn't be in proportion. Um, so that, that seems reasonable. So the process with these related rate problems, so let's just make a little note on that. The related rate strategy that we've employed a couple of times here is uh, one, the first thing, we have to find an equation that relates the variables. And so in the first problem about the sphere, Right, I had to know, okay, the volume is changing. So that means I need an equation for volume of a sphere. They also asked about the radius. And so the volume and the radius go together in that equation. Uh, in the situation with the ships, they formed a right triangle. So I said, okay, the Pythagorean theorem would connect the sides of the right triangle. So somehow we have to look at the situation and we have to have an equation uh, that relates the variables. So that's like the first step. Step two is then at some particular instant, we need to know values and we need values of the variables involved and their rates of change. And we have to have enough information to solve for whichever part we're looking for, which is usually the rate of change of one of the variables. So we'll have enough information to find that. And so then from there, once we have the equation, we have the, the suitable values and variables, we can then solve for a particular rate. And the equation, that tends to be the hardest part. So we usually have to often do some geometry if our equation is not given to us. So let's look at a situation where we have to do some more geometry. Let's pick something from your homework. So the revenue one, we're just given the equation, no geometry necessary. That one's pretty straightforward. Altitude of a triangle. So this one is kind of similar to the one we just did, but we don't have a right triangle. This is a good one right here. All right. This one's a bit challenging. So we'll be able to set it up. We may have time to solve it. And we have another day on this. Whoa, what do they just do? I hit the wrong button. My touchpad on my laptop's a little touchy sometimes. There we go. All right. So usually with a problem like this, I got to read through it several times and try and figure out how to make a sketch for it. And oftentimes I screw it up when I first try. Like that uh, ship problem we just did. I did it earlier. And the first time I did it, I forgot about A was 10, you know, uh, not nautical miles further out than B and that messed things up. All right, so for this one right here, we have water leaking out of an inverted conical tank 
at a rate of 6,400 cubic centimeters per minute. So cubic centimeters, I see that and I'm thinking, okay, that's a volume. Oops, come on, pen, there we go. So this right here per minute, that is a dV dt. So you gotta kind of take some notes as you go through it. Inverted conical tank, maybe we could draw that. So inverted conical tank, I'm assuming looks like this. All right, at the same time water is being pumped out. Okay, so we have water flowing out. We also have water flowing in. The tank has a height of 15 meters. Okay, so my, ske my sketch is not exactly uh, pro proportional to what's given, but that's okay, I think. So we have a height, 15 meters, and then we have a radius here, 3.5 meters. If the water level is rising at a rate of 17 centimeters per minute, all right, let's uh, think about that. The water level, so the water level, so we have some water in here, And that height right there is rising. So maybe I'm gonna call that height Y. And they say it's rising at a rate of 17 centimeters per minute. So then they're giving me their dy dt, the, the, the rate at which that water height, water height is rising. So dy dt is, 17 centimeters per minute. So I can put that in here. I should probably label my dvdt up here. dvdt is 6,400 cubic centimeters per minute. Oh, interesting. So now we're mixing centimeters and meters. So we're gonna have to make a decision uh, about that probably which way we're gonna go. All right, when the height is three meters. Okay, so that right there happens when Y is three meters. Find the rate at which the water is being pumped into the tank. All right, so this right here, water is leaking out. So that is a negative because it's leaking out and then water is also being pumped in. So dV dt is actually a combination here. So dV dt, we've got the leak negative 6,400 plus some missing amount. I'm gonna call question mark. So that's dV dt. All right, so now we need a relationship between these things. So let's figure that out. Volume of a conical tank. So volume in this case is equal to one third pi r squared h. So that's the volume of a cone. Now we have one, two, three variables, which is a problem, but we have a solution to that, I think. So I think the solution here is the shape of this cone here. So the side profile, if we take a slice through the center of the cone down that vertical axis there, we get this right triangle there. And the inside this right triangle, let's see, here's my highlighter. The radius is always proportional to the height because the triangle is always the same shape, right? The angles inside there always stay the same. So, yeah, so let me think about that for a second. Let's use a different color. So we need to get rid of one of these variables. We wanna keep H, we need to get rid of R. So what's the relationship to H and R here? So if we look at this triangle here, 
uh, at any point, here is my H in the triangle, and here is my R. And every single one of those triangles is related to the biggest version, right? The whole size of this thing. So let's say here's the biggest one, and the biggest version has a height of 15 and a radius of 3.5. So the ratio of the radius to the height always has to be 3.5 to 15 in proportion. Because at any stage in the water level, we always have this triangular cross section through the middle. So that means the radius is equal to 3.5 over 15 times the height. So this allows me to whittle the equation down to just the two variables I want. Let's, let's read back through this to double check that. So we got the water leaking out, blah, 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 water's pumped in. The tank has a height of 15 centimeters and the diameter, oh, diameter, not radius, oops. Diameter of 3.5, good thing I reread that. So that isn't 3.5, it's 3.5 over two, which is what, 1.75? Yeah. Okay, so let's correct. That is really 1.75, 1 1.75. All right, so caught one part. Diameter is 3.5, not the radius. All right, the water level is rising at a rate. So they're only talking about the rise in water. They're not, I don't see anywhere in here where it talks about a change in radius, just the change in the height of the water. Yep, so we need to get the radius out of there. Otherwise, it just complicates things quite a bit more. So then I can rewrite my volume formula for this particular cylinder, or it's not cylinder, uh, cone. So my new volume formula, let's go green, is one third pi, and we're replacing the radius with this expression. And let's maybe have Desmos clean that up a little bit. I'm trying to remember if this Desmos cleans up fractions. I know I could do it by hand. I'm just feeling like I don't want to. 1.75 over 15. And this one doesn't, oh, it does have the fraction to decimal button there, which is 7 sixtieths. Yeah, we don't want to introduce any rounding error. Yeah, so we could reduce it or we could just leave it as the 1.75 over 15. Um, I guess I'm going to go for 7 sixtieths instead. So we can also say this is 7 sixtieths h at any point, but that's squared. And so cleaning that up, we're gonna get, let's see, seven squared is 49 pi. 60 squared, let's see, 60 times 60 is 36, 100 times three, oh, is that like, a lot. 60 squared times 3, 10,800. Sure, it sounds right. So let's see, we've got our one third in there, we've got our pi, our 7 squared, and our 60 squared. So then I just have h squared times h, which is h cubed. So this is my new revised equation right there. And now I can relate dv dt to dh dt by taking the derivative. So the derivative with respect to time of v has to be equal to the derivative with respect to time on this side. So the 49 pi, oops, 49 pi over 10,800 is just a constant. Derivative of h cubed is 3h squared chain rule says multiply by dh dt. Since you're taking the derivative with respect to time, not with respect to h. So now I have a relationship between the two of them. And so I can plug in the other things that I know. So let's see. We have rates in cubic centimeters. So I guess we're gonna have to change the meters. So three meters would be 300 centimeters. So that's my H at that time. 
And then as far as DVDT goes, we have that missing part of DVDT that I was calling question mark. So plug in everything I know in now, I get negative, what was it, 6,400? Yep. Plus the missing rate going in is equal to 49 pi over 10,800 times three, uh, let's see, H is 300 centimeters, right? Squared, and we were given dH dt, remember? That was, or I'm calling it Y here, that was 17 centimeters per minute, so we do have that too. So times that 17. And so then we can just calculate that and solve for the question mark. So our missing rate in has to be all of this stuff here, plus that 6,400. Oof, that was a workout. So these problems are challenging. We've got to definitely take careful notes uh, about the things that we're given, and we have to find some kind of an equation. And sometimes we got to modify that equation a little bit, like we had to do in this case here. We had to do that back here, where I placed the x and y with functions of t. All right, so these are definitely tough problems. So jump right on it. Today's Thursday. We don't have class again until Monday. So please do a, a little bit every day. Message me if you get stuck. And then Monday, we'll tie this up by doing a whole bunch more uh, of these problems. All right, so let's stop sharing. Yo, thank you for playing. 